All right, so I'm going to read uh, Varney's bio as it is from their latest book, Like a Tree Walking. Varney Anthony Ezekiel Capaldeo, FRSL, is a Trinidadian Scottish writer of poetry and non-fiction. Capaldeo's eight books and nine pamphlets include Skin Can Hold, Carkin at 2019, and The Dusty Angel, um, Oyster Catcher 2021. Their interests include plurilingualism i nearly tripped on that one plurilingualism traditional uh masquerade multidisciplinary collaboration they are writer in residence and professor congratulations at the university of york a visiting scholar at pembroke college cambridge and an honorary student of christ church in oxford um welcome barney how are you good thank you cold yes very chilly where are you um broadcasting from from North Edinburgh. Oh, Edinburgh. Yeah, we were there. I was with you a few weeks ago, wasn't it? Ah. That was good. Yes, that's right. Yes. So... Hey, uh, Josie. I think Josie's there. Yes, 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 yes. We, we'll, we'll, bring, uh, we'll bring her in in a bit. Um, we'll, uh-huh. we'll, do, we'll do our bit first, and then we'll get Josie in the mix as well. Um, Age before beauty. Oh, this is it. <laughs> this is it. So, yeah, Varney, congratulations on the uh, professorship at York University, I saw, I saw that, that was, that's great news. Um, and also, congratulations on writing another wonderful poetry collection. Um, I, I always try and write down a bag of questions to kick things off with uh, discussing these very important and, and very complex books, which I love, I can talk about for hours and hours. Um, the first question that I had after reading the book, I've read it twice now, and you really get a sense of seeing. There is so much attention to detail in this book, Uh, both as a, I know on the blurb it says uh, around it taking its title from a story of sight miraculously regained. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the kind of idea with seeing and attention to detail uh, that the book encompasses throughout. Yes, well, of course, there are three aspects to the seeing, uh, which isn't something I would have brought out, but that's something that I am very glad you brought out, because that's definitely in there. One is the original story, which is in the Gospel of Mark, and there's a person who has his sight restored uh, by being healed by Christ, uh, and uh, sees people like trees walking. And I always wondered whether that's a true vision, you know, seeing us like trees walking, Mm whether that's a truer vision than seeing us with terribly bounded bodies. Mm. And I also wonder whether it would be trees the right way up or trees upside down. So would you see our mycelial networks or would you see the, the transpiring leaves? So that's one thing. If you really saw people, would there be something more like trees? Mm. And uh, the second thing is personally, I'm visually impaired. I'm extremely short-sighted uh, to the extent I can get free stuff on the NHS, and I can't see if somebody waves at me in a river Mm. and we're both swimming. I won't be able to see that. You probably will think you are a tree. And that's the second thing, that I think the sense of sight is particularly important to me because it's not a given. And when I don't have corrective lenses in, I know things by depth of field Mm. and temperature and texture. And then when I do have the lenses in, they're extraordinarily sharp. Is that is that <laughs> where the, the line eyes dried by overwatching in Nocturne number six? Is that where that line comes from, the contact lenses? No, it doesn't. It doesn't. That's a different story. Mm. But the, the third aspect of, of sight I was thinking of uh, is the idea of inner vision. Mm. So what you see when you close your eyes. But no, where, where that line comes from is when my mother was unwell in hospital and I was trying to stay up all night to look at her oxygen levels oh, oh. because there wasn't enough staff to watch her oxygen levels, which were dropping. Yeah. I was staying up trying to remain awake by rereading parts of the Commedia and reading St. John of the Cross's poems. And my eyes became incredibly dry. Mm. I mean, you could understand why people talk about propping open eyelids with matchsticks. It's one thing to think that you're awake all night writing an essay or something, but to be awake looking at tiny numbers in a machine is a completely different sort of concentration. Yeah, I think that was one. I think that was out of the nocturnes. Um, that was my favorite. That was one that really stood out for me. 
And I think that throughout the book, or what it does so well is this balance between this very kind of private, intimate realism with a surrealism as well, you know, like trees walking upside down and, and ideas like this, that it, I just, I love that. And the, the sonnet that I posted on Twitter today, um, it's the playfulness, you know, like you're so inventive at the level of the line that just kind of pushes these poems into a completely new space. In Praise of Birds, which is the poem that you start on, it's so exuberant, like it's so joyous, like it's looking at birds and all the different types of birds in such a, a loving and affectionate and considered way that I, I read that twice. Like I read it once and then I thought, wow, but it's long, right? And it was like, wow, what just, what just happened? And the images that you bring out in that are absolutely phenomenal. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that poem in Praise of Birds. I think I loved it so much from the get-go because I've read them odes before, you know, like odes that are celebratory around the thing. But for that, for some reason, mm -hmm. kicking off a book there, it was a huge, huge move. Yeah, well, I knew I wanted to begin with In Praise Of uh, because uh, I didn't want the book to immediately get into my usual stuff of violence, misery, loss, uh, war, etc. And uh, I've always been fascinated by birds uh, without knowing very much about them because having come to the Britain when I was 18, I had begun to know about birds in Trinidad to the extent of knowing their calls at different points of the day and knowing their parents and habits at different times in the year. And then there was a huge break and I was among different birds and I have never got quite used to that. So there's a peculiar way in which I have a sense of where I am in the hours of the day when I go back to Trinidad, which is modulated by bird calls and whether they're rising or falling. And as yet, I don't have that in the UK despite having lived here many more years, three times as many years or something, twice as many, my math is bad now. Mm. And uh, the poem itself was improvised for an event uh, which Caroline Bergvall had curated uh, as a, a response to the old Irish uh, poem about Sweeney, the king, mm. who m is uh, translated as Mad Sweeney, though Selena Guinness, the novelist, explained to me it was more mad in the sense of angry or in a state of extreme outrage and uh, excess, uh, mm. rather than mad in the sense of wandering around in the 1820s, taking a bit of opium and fancying yourself. And I think that poem, the old Irish poem, has got far more exuberance than mine, uh, and I perhaps borrowed a little bit from it uh, yeah, no, by it's... letting myself be inhabited, letting myself be inhabited by it. Yeah. yeah, and it had that energy. I think it's that gusto, that that kind of push. Um, and it felt to me like somebody has just regained something. I've got here, there's a kind of, there's a, there's, there's a relief that comes from that poem. Like when you read it, it's somebody who might have been, you know, I mean, I, I use that example of the of Shawshank Redemption, you know, when, when you've been in prison for a long time and you come out and you see the world anew. And it has that real energy to it of that revitalizing quality that I really, really, really liked indeed. And then the next section what I wanted to, to go into was the quotidian and how you kind of look at the very every single day, dogs walking in the park, birds, swans at a lake, you know, like, and how you bring all that to life with such colour and vitality um, that, again, it just, it feels like you're, you're reading a mural. Um, it's so rich, the tapestry of these, of these poems. Um, that's not really a question. It's more just a kind of observation, really. Um, the question I guess I did have was, because the book covers so many different elements, you know, you've got the pandemic, you've got this idea of seeing and not seeing. What was the kind of process of putting these poems together? How did you go about arranging them and writing them? Well, it started off much earlier. I think they started off when I was still the Douglas Castor Fellow in Leeds. That was 2017 to 19. And I was asked by poet in the city and the British Library to work on the Collections in Verse project, mm. which aimed to bring and translate the exhibition The Windrush to audiences who were not based in London and elicit their own responses uh, and using materials well from local archives and libraries. Uh, I worked with a number of community groups in South Leeds, uh, most of whom had no connection ancestrally to The Windrush, but all of whom could identify journeys in their lives, whether it was from illness to health or from agricultural to urban, 
or from Bangladesh to the UK or from York to Leeds. And so the long Windrush poem had that idea of movement in it mm. and uh, movement on the ship. The ship, of course, uh, is a, a peculiar thing. It's a vessel which is and isn't a home because while you're on the boat, you can imagine where you're going to land, but you haven't landed there yet. And uh, I knew that that was going to match for me with another poem, which was a long Odyssey response. Uh, I've wanted to write an Odyssey response for many, many years, uh, not because of Walcott, uh, but actually because of Odysseus, uh, because we had uh, children's retellings of the classical Western myths at home, and I, I believed they were true when I was six years old. So I believed that they were true that if I went into the garden at the wrong time of year, I would probably meet Hades. <laughs> and so, so I, in, in a way, I had a date with this poem. Yeah. And the wonderful composer Gamal Khamis and the actor Christopher Kent commissioned me to contribute material to their Odyssey recital, which was a series of, of performances to do with migrants and home and belonging. J.L. Williams and uh, Yusuf Kazmier also contributed poetic material to that. And the thing there was I didn't know, I knew I wanted to end with one of them, but I didn't know which one. Because the Odyssey is a bleaker poem, the Odyssey response, but it ends in a way that opens out. Hmm. Whereas the Windrush poem seems to me very much to have recounted a history and brought us to a place. Hmm. And I didn't want the book to end with a feeling of ending. I wanted it to end with an opening out. Yeah. So in the end, I'm not not really pleased with that, but it was the only choice left. The lot of the middle of the book and the rest of it comes from taking the same walk over and over again, and also from practicing stillness exercises among trees and trying to tune into micro environments of sound and silence around trees. Hmm. Yeah, there's, yeah. There's a lot of links to nature, and I just you know this poem as well is particularly fascinating. Um, I don't know if everyone can see that, the Eurasia uh, poem. Oh, is that the Julian of Norwich one? Yeah, I, this one really got me. Um, I mean, it's so fragmented and broken. And and I mean, I, I love these kind of poems that you just, you swim in them, you can get lost inside. Could you talk a little bit about this one, the thinking behind it, the intention? Thank you. Yes, uh, I, I'm glad you asked about that. And in fact, I almost didn't put them in because I didn't think people would like them. I've been fascinated with Julian Nor of Norwich for many, many years. Uh, I mean, with Norwich itself for more than half my life, even though I haven't lived there yet. And uh, she was, of course, uh, an anchoress uh, living in a cell, which was uh, not really lonely because people used to come and ask her about stuff. Mm. So it was the opposite of lonely in certain ways. Uh, it was a place of stability and to people's point of return. And she had most extraordinary visions uh, with the... Uh, floods of blood and whatnot. And uh, I remember reading uh, the Testament of Julian of Norwich in both versions and uh, realizing I had to read it in a very spacey way that the page would seem to flicker in and out of focus and I would have to stop a long time uh, mm. with one bit uh, and then go on and go back. Uh, and it was really as if something were moving me in and out uh, and closer and further. So the Erasure poem is like a trace of that process of reading. Uh, and I, I try to select elements that I want to float. So it's like the floating approach as the text brings you back into itself and before it sends you floating out again. Yeah. It's very immersive. It's incredibly immersive. And I think with some of my favourite ones in the in the collection, you really feel that you're kind of being taken along with them, which I guess the idea of the journey, as you were saying, is part of that intention um, to feel that, and you come, you lose your way, like you become disorientated in some of these poems, and you need to really kind of, you know, hold on to the line that you're reading and, and slow down. I think that's what's so amazing about these is that it forces you to really to slow down and then speed up. So, you know, it's it's an amazing relationship dialogue exercise between poet and reader. I think this kind of endeavor. Um, I wonder if you could read maybe one or two poems from the book for us, if, if you wouldn't mind. Yes, of course. I'll read the night poem you're talking about, That'd Nocturne number six. Oh, I love that, yeah. Night. I'm not going to say you aren't there. You hurt my eyes with promises of rest. 
stretch weighted blankets on warmed beds under which the hills can crawl, stirring out their masts, mansions, scars, and forests. You press hills into your dark like a brush, wetting paper with colour. You are high up and fluid. Night, I'm going to hold on to you today, in daytime, in your absence, in your sharp absence. In bright fluorescence, I hold to you, surrounded by fluid darkness, indoors and out, in scathing sunlight, darkness nonetheless sheathes me as if I lie down on air, high up. I have not been schooled to see like a scientist. Therefore, I know your contours without having to touch you. And I know you're not there, not in that way. I am body of exhaustion, frequenting shops where natural tears are sold by formula with droppers, eyes dried by overwatching, overweeping. I am not like that, night. I expected to break on you, holding on. The time for warning is done, night. Now is the time for joy. And I'll read the other one you mentioned, and this one's set in an imaginary Cambridge in Norwich, and it is about possibly not meeting a certain friend again because it was locked down in Trinidad with the borders closed. Mm. And I realized that I had known this person so long and so well that if we were to die in different countries, that there would be no sense of tragedy or finality because our lives had been woven together already so much. Mm. So that makes sense. I'm not sure that, that the actual physical death or the separation by distance had stopped mattering. Yes. There had been enough story. If there is an afterwards, I'll find you where we met. On stone bright streets, I imagine. We may have lost people, not ourselves, not yet ourselves. If we have much to say, we do not say it. We have had years. A new friend is with us. New friends are hard to make in middle age. Who can introduce us? Silence runs like treacle over flint, coffee, river water. New words like petrichor, green willows, no words. If this were a sonnet, we could turn. Now I would turn and I should have rhymed. I am without those things they say a poem needs. Sugar falls off a donut in a bag, in a rose garden, with a pack of cards. Mm. Yeah, I love that. I, I haven't read a, a sonnet that brilliant for a very very long time uh, it kind of i think for me it does all the things that a sonnet should do in that it also undermines the sonnet which i love so much <laughs> like it has this power to it that kind of you know on the volta <laughs> where you just it you kind of hit the fourth that the fourth wall break the fourth wall and uh yeah i don't know it's so it's so great and it ha it's it's interesting because when i read it it's it's a lot more serious and somber now hearing you read it. When I read it, I really got the playfulness. I really got the cheekiness of the poem. But then you say it's a relationship between two people that could, you know, if you're a friend with someone and you know someone for a very long time, you do have that very mm -hmm. casual rapport with them, right? And I think that, that playfulness, that, yeah. that comes across in it so well now that you've, now that you've said it. Yes, it's about a very playful set of people. And, uh, What's interesting to me as well, and what you're saying about the sonnet, as opposed for me, the sonnet uh, really does have the force of Cavalcanti. I always hear Cavalcanti and uh, also Sydney much more than Shakespeare mm. in terms of who my sonneteers are. Mm -hmm. So they're not expecting to return again. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Um, I had, I had a, the one final thing that I guess I wanted to talk about were the poems mm. that you had around COVID, the, uh, the one to... Uh, coronavirus swing which I thought was, yes. was was I thought that was absolutely brilliant and and there is like a, a kind of musicality to this because oh there's another one oh yeah the nocturnes and then the lullabies as well like there is a very strong musical element to this as well I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that before we bring Josie on 
Yes, of course. Well, I did write those pandemic poems, that particular coronavirus sequence, uh, which was dedicated to Jack Belloli, very quickly over the course of a few days. And there are lots of different people smuggled into it, including the poet Kaya Miller, who had been staying with my mother during Carnival when the pandemic had already begun, but we weren't aware of it as yet. But the swing comes from having done authentic jazz dance with Nikki Santilli, who's also an expert on the prose poem. And I really can't dance, but Nikki did her best to teach me. And she also talked to me a lot about the way that jazz and poetry or movement and sound could work together. And those top starts, uh, or the, the improvising off a base of learned steps and sequences, uh, are what informed that particular poem that you picked up on. Mm. There's always an edge in, in swing, uh, in traditional jazz, I should say. There's an edge of uh, almost falling over or pushing something. So unlike a ballet, it's not about the complete graceful swan-like poise. It's about taking things just to that edge where they're daring or sexy or not quite in balance. Mm. Yeah, that's really interesting. I'd, I'd never thought of it in, in that sense before, the way that... I, I, don't, I don't know much about dance, to be honest. I, mean, I like watching it, but I don't really know much about what's going on inside it. But now to hear you say that, that makes sense. Do you want to read that? the uh, the coronavirus sequence um or maybe one or two of those poems because i i think it's brilliant like they, they feel although you wrote them so quickly they feel so different to each other which is you know yes, that's, uh, that's, that's amazing I, th I think that because people had been uh, talking and thinking so intensely about it and also because uh, jack in particular to whom the sequence is dedicated has done so much work with people who for whatever reason are unhoused uh, mm and always has a very keen perspective uh, that the we, that people say we this and we that, that that we needs to be far more sharply focused to take in a variety of experience. The thing that I do hope you ask Josie about, which I shouldn't really preempt, uh, is there's a secretly shared poem. Polly Atkin and, and Josie and I got together for several strange sessions and divided a triple poem mm -hmm. of which there's one part in here. I think Josie has one part in another book and Polly has one part in another book. There's a long response to Thomas Clark. But it also exists as a flip book where you can flip all three parts and remix the poem completely. Oh, wow. That so sounds, that sounds that, that's, that's so unwalking. <laughs> it is. We wanted to talk about queer and disabled bodies uh, or bodies of, of colour or gender not expected to be walking on hills and mountains. Right, right, right. That, that, okay, I'll read you one plague poem. N now we are things invisible. The inessential park is closed. Its benches clean of homeless bodies hurting less in sleep. Sigs, wasteful pansies, gratuitous marigolds, dogs running like flames and vaguely sinister statues are out like fountains in drought. The wrong romances will not fall among its turning leaves. Who would make a fearful call, craving escape from beatings, can't expect to coast on help from public services. The sky is a roof only to birds and drones, no place to lose the words of crazy makers. You can grow your inward silence indoors now. The inessential park is closed. Memory restyles it like a scroll, adding some willows and a bridge to which you run to catch a wish. The visible, unusable park, its blue imagined bridge for love of things invisible. And one of the thoughts on that, as I know there's been a lot of, of discourse about uh, parks being unsafe, uh, but during the pandemic, I was thinking about homes being unsafe uh, mm. and parks being where you could go to make a call about a domestic violence situation or to catch some Wi-Fi from a cafe if you can't afford Wi-Fi, that sort of thing. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, yeah. That, that character was a bleak note. Yeah. No, that, no that, was, that was super important. And I think, again, it was like the, the lines that you had in that one thing that he just now as you were reading it was the, the kind of cinema of the poem mixed in with thought and it never really sits in one place in the way that I think the best poems for me work in that they kind of doing seven eight different things at once in the way that a drummer might 
and that's what you really exemplify i think in that in that poem um phenomenal stuff um that was Vani was reading from uh, their pbs collection uh like a tree walking that was nominated the choice award uh so if you want to grab that you can get it from the pbs uh, website thank you very much Vani. thank you for your time for your thank insight you. for your for your mind and generosity um very much appreciated i'm gonna bring uh josie in now and we're gonna talk yeah. to her about i'm gonna the first thing i'm gonna ask is about this trinity poem so the holy trinity and see and see how we end up with that right let me see if i can get josie on now yes i can all right and thank you again Vani. there's josie uh, hi have you got me got you yeah can, can you hear us there we go hey anthony hey anthony how are you okay hey. you both um, yes great great all right all right let's get into it um thank you josie thank you for joining us uh we're going to be discussing um josie's new book deep will acadia that's out on picador there it is fantastic look at that cover that cover's amazing um and um i'm going to start off by reading josie's bio and then uh we'll get into some of that i want to hear about the holy trinity thing i think that's the first thing that i want to I want to I want to learn about. Um, so Harry Josephine Giles is a writer and performer from Orkney, living in Edinburgh. Their collection Tungit was shortlisted for the Forward Prize for the best first collection, and the Games for the Edwin Morgan Poetry Award and the Saltire Prize for best collection. Working across poetry, theatre, and games, they were the 2009 BBC Scotland Slam champion and have performed globally from New York's Bowery Poetry to Romania's. Test, I think, is that how you say it? Test, Test, and the New Zealand Writers Festival. Welcome, Josie. Good to see you again. Nice to be here again. Hi. Good to see you. Yeah, we've worked. We've worked on. Um, we worked on the games uh, a few years back, and it was an absolute pleasure to to work with Josie on her poetry and and see how how the mind of something so inventive and original works. So the first thing I'm going to ask is this Trinity poem. How did that go about? How did that come about? Um, we were. I I don't. I think I I think it was I think it was Anthony Vani's idea at first. I think it was you that sent the email that was like, "Let's think about let's think about alternative understandings of the poetry of nature and the poetry of walking," um, and. Yeah, so so we were thinking about about gender, disability, race in nature poetry, and the problem of eco poetry, and the problem of this kind of field of um, uh, eco poetry that where where the human body in its complexity and in its in its politicized complexity isn't present or is transparent or is assumed as this kind of neutral observer or neutral enjoyer of nature so we were struggling with that and for me that's part of a a long running now a year's running kind of investigation of what i think about is the the kind of absent trans pastoral um i'm somebody who spends a lot of time outdoors i grew up very rural i grew up in a very small island i grew up outside and now i spend a lot of time in the mountains i spend a lot of time walking in the highlands um and there's i'm usually like if, you know, if I spend a week in the Highlands, I'll be the only trans person that I see ever, like the whole time. And and there's not many other trans people that I will go walking with. And in the lit, the, in the kind of existing and emergent trans literature, there is next to no nature poetry. There's next to no like pastoral fiction, and and that absence is really disturbing to me. So I'm I'm kind of on a long project of trying to rewrite trans back into the rural mm. and back in. To, um, the ecological and thinking about what that means, especially at a time when, like, we're, I mean, we've been kind of explicitly accused of being, like, anti-ecological in, uh, in recent, <laughs> recent Guardian editorial that was like, how dare these people try and exceed the limits of the body? And I'm like, because it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. It actually makes me think of, um, 
just hearing you, you you talk about that the idea of the black body in nature as well and which kind of engendered this um what's the black nature is the anthology uh, that was published in the states that's absolutely phenomenal that's just black poets writing about being in nature and of course jason alan passant as well the carcanet poet writing around the black body in nature and i think that there is something again it shouldn't be something that surprises us but the way that these ideas are you know that who is allowed to be among nature and who's supposed to be in the city and who's supposed to be at a desk and who's supposed to be in a hospital you know these things are really really interesting so yeah thank you for, for breaking all that down um congratulations on this wonderful collection this one novel um i think my mind and brain and spirit and soul were fully contorted while i was uh reading this um there was this i mean there's there's too much going on to be able to kind of capture properly in half an hour but we'll, we'll do our best um i wonder rather than me kind of making a pig's ear out of trying to explain what this book is about i wonder if you could give um the the audience here a bit of a breakdown of what that the conceit is behind this book. <laughs> sure, I mean, the, the, the tagline is, is an ordinary language science fiction verse novel, which is obviously a completely obvious and popular genre. Um, it's, a, it's, um, it's about my home, which is Orkney, um, which is the Northern Isles of Scotland, the first, the first islands that you come to when you go north off the coast of Scotland. So you get Orkney and then Farrell and then Shetland. Um, so it's, it's a story about Orkney, but it's imagining Orkney as if it were a distant space station in the far future. Um, that's that's kind of the nub of it, and 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 the the kind of the reason for doing one of this kind of connects to the previous bit of conversation. The reason for doing that is is because the land that I grew up in. Hey. Sorry, and the language that I spoke as a child are are conceived of like as rural, passing, nostalgic, fading, etc. And I wanted to kind of project all of that into the future. And at the same time, I also wanted to imagine queer stories, trans stories, ecological stories into um that kind of space which is in in the in the island literature and in scottish literature they are again like very very rarely present so it's all of that and then it is um written both in in the Orkney language which i grew up with and in a like a parallel english translation at the same time and there's a lot we could chat about right there but yeah in essence, it's a story about islands as if they were space stations right yeah um, and i think that's what i wanted to that was the first thing i actually had was the question around the space station and how you kind of bring in language, class, gender, like all of those things are all heavily incorporated. And we can talk about the formal presentation as well. Um, and I mean, I, I, I can't speak Orkney, but and I, I kind of tried to do both. And I ended up just going to the English afterwards, you know, at the, the bottom, which I thought, I asked myself why I was doing that. Um, and I didn't want to, you know, really work for the, for the Orkney language. So I wonder, yeah, what the kind of ideas were behind having you know what what was the intention to make people work for it there? <laughs> well i mean i i've spent i've spent a while working in different forms of scots it's a language that i love and a language that i care about so it was it was for me it was never a question of am i going to write this in scots or not i was always it's always always a project about about scots which is a minority language is a language that um, whose 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 literature is minoritized and isn't read enough, and I wanted to put that language in a format that might like get a different audience interested in reading it, and it also might push that language into different places. Hence, science fiction novel, because I was yeah. like, and I'm not the first person to do that. I was like, maybe if I do this like thing that's a science fiction novel, it will get some different people reading this language. So it was that on the one hand, but the question for me was, do I have any English in it or not? Yeah. That was the difficult question. And in the end, I chose to for that similar reason, which is wanting to give different folk a route into the book. I mean, Orkney has a population of 20,000, about half of whom are regular kind of speakers of that form of the language in some way or another. Um, and not so you know that's a maximum audience of like ten thousand people you know um and they're you know, they're all gonna buy the book um 
but I was interested in what happens to Anglophone readers when they encounter a sister language to English, a language that they can half understand and half not understand, and how can I lead them into that language? So, so that was the kind of decision to have English in there, but have it, in, and I'll, I'll, I'll show on the, on the screen, in, the, in this, like, English is minoritized on the page, it's, you know, two thirds of the way down, it's in a smaller font, it's in prose rather than poetry, and it, there's some techniques that are used to kind of keep sending people back to the, um, to the Orkney and trying to lead people into it, yeah. Yeah, I thought that was an amazing, because it is, it's kind of a multi-dimensional experience, I think, when you're reading it like that. And because I think everything was doing so much, I, I found myself getting slightly overwhelmed. So I had to just slow everything down and just really take in the sections. And, cause, you know, you've, there's a storyline, there's, a, there's a, a kind of narrative that is at play. And you're studying the narrative, the characters, while the book's also talking to these hugely, like, intellectual, cultural, political spaces at the same time. It was absolutely incredible how it was managing to hold all those places um what was the what was the thinking around i mean my questions are on the floor and now this guy is on my knee um so what was the thinking around class because I, I found that the distinction between the art student and um the student from mars was it who the kind of i mm -hmm. guess was the more middle class like, what was the the thinking behind having that scenario play out um well it's 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 really interesting how this story has has resonated with different people because um in so so there's two so to kind of for the audience there's two central characters there's astrid who is from this like distant space station which is or called arcadia which is it's um it's essentially like a resource extraction hub, like it's uh, which Orkney is as well. Orkney is an oil refinery, right? So it's it's um, sort of industrial, sort of rural as a space station. It's on the fringes of like human life in space. So we've so got this character Astrid, who's from there, and then we've got this character Darling, who is from Mars, which is kind of figured as the kind of economic centre of this galaxy, um, and they meet and fall in love, and like. Lots of people have you now spoken to me about kind of the class aspects of that narrative. Um, and those are there, if you want to read them, there is like a working class, middle class kind of conflict going on. But in Orkney, that would rarely be spoken about as a class conflict. It would more commonly be spoken about as a Orcadian versus incomer conflict. Oh, okay. But in like that rural island space, class is rarely part of the conversation and it's much more about were you born in these islands or did you come to these islands and what are those differences there is class layered on top of that but in orkney um language uh, accent become proxies for class in lots of sort of ways and also class is complicated in that a lot of the kind of wealthy landowners in orkney are actually kind of from a long-term Orkney background. Most of the people that run the council are from a long-term Orkney background. And a lot of the um, poorest people in Orkney um, are not necessarily from a long term. So, so actually class is really complicated in the island situation and is not always the vector of, of analysis, or although sometimes it is in other important ways. So both of those readings are kind of meant to be there in the book. And for me, it was about across lines of power and especially across lines of language and how language is a stand-in for different forms of power how do we relate to each other how do we how can we fall in love can we be in love what are we expecting from each other and that becomes like also i just wanted to tell a romance like yeah. i wanted to tell a love story yeah and that's what you feel is really at the kind of heart of of the whole the, the intention of, of of the book one thing that i found super fascinating and it kind of it kind of became a thing that i got a bit obsessed by as i read on was the compounded words that you'd created and the fluidity of language you know like how that how it was gesturing towards a fluidity like a kind of a, a yeah like a non-binding way of thinking about words. i wonder if you could like just talk a little bit about again if that was your intention with having those compounded words in in the english yeah so so to 
Um, to explain that for the audience, if, if you've not got the book, like when I have a, an Orkney word that doesn't necessarily have a direct cognate in English, in the English version, I'll um, translate it multiply. So I've just opened my book randomly. Um, uh, here's a word, yever, which is an Orkney word, and I translate that as eager, shake, anxious. Um, uh, burl, a uh, durl, I've, I've translated as thrill, pierce, shake, whirl is like one word. So that's what's going on there. Um, and one of the reasons for doing that is pointing to like the insufficiency of translation and, and showing how when we translate, we're always losing meanings, collapsing meanings. Mm -hmm. Another is kind of the opposite to ask people when they're looking at English or thinking about English to think about the the multiplicity that is in any given word and how words cannot be so simply defined. And then the third reason is also to do this work of minoritizing English on the page, that by making the English not transparent, not straightforward to read, I'm hoping to like keep pointing people back to the Arcadian and having them think about the Arcadian. Um, so it's I call them speed bumps, yeah. essentially, which is your thing, they're a way of slowing down the reading. Yeah. yeah. That's exactly that's exactly how I would have thought about it. And yeah, I did find myself going into the to the Orkney to see if there was the equivalent to try and see what that was doing. Um, and sometimes, yeah, they slowed you down. Other other ones, you just kind of you sped over them. But then you they were like three nouns. Like I mean, sometimes the construction was different, right? It wasn't always the same. You'd have like a verb and two nouns together, or two nouns and a verb. And it was just it was super interesting how you were getting meaning from essentially like three separate words that were all being put together that was super impressive i'm going to ask the big thing do you mind doing a reading from the book now i'm, I'm very happy to um, somebody in the chat mentioned a particular poem which is maybe it's a good one i think for getting into some of these issues which is um when astrid who is the um who's the character from, from the space station from Arcadia, takes Darling, after they've kind of hooked up, um, home to her parents for dinner for the first time. Um, and I'm just going to read it in, in the Orkney because we haven't got a, a full amount of time, but this is also one of the ones that I think is, is easier to follow in the Orkney. Um, so this is about some of those dynamics that we talked about. And I think, I think some of the, the language dynamics that we talk about in this poem, like do map on to different power dynamics like class in the world as well. So, Astrid tucks darling him for dinner. That is me new friend. And the layers in friend. It's not fairly clear and it'll no be explained. Darling is winsome now. Just something other as the scar thing or tourist Astrid met. A smile in her fun turtled face, Rory Clays. And the Midras family, it's like her body is lowing. Maybe without your parents learnt it performance. But Darlene's silence about her own feathers, Astrid's, I were thankful for her parents' mate and kindness. Until fair into the meal, she hears their vules rounding, their consonants clipping, their words switching to marry darling's own, and gets unspeakable barman. And when her own in is one, she sits quiet, wanting a body to notice, her mother to smile and say, but oh, and tack her back to the old family table. But the hurt of Astrid's silence is awful gravity. And so the conversation is fagging, fan, is hearing itself, is less and less real getting, till it's just darling that's smiling and speaking yet. Yeah. That's that one. <laughs> That's amazing. The, just the sound is absolutely phenomenal. Like the music of how those words all come together. And it's so melodic as well. I mean, I, I didn't understand all of those words and that's absolutely fine. It was just hearing the way that they, that they all come together. Could you read um, from, I don't know if this is, I don't know if you can even do this, like, but read from the English as well, um, from a scene sure. uh, perhaps 
to see how that works. From the same from the same one. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've just I've just closed the book, so now I have to find it again. Sorry, right. shouldn't have closed that. Um, what, page, what page is it? I want to read along as well. I don't know. I don't know. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Uh, page eighty three, eighty four. So if I give that one in the English, so that you can hear it there, and this is this is one of the less kind of dense ones, but um, Astrid takes Darling home for dinner. This is my new friend, and the layers in friend really aren't clear and won't be explained. Darling is charming, attractive now. She's something other than the frightened, nervous tourist, tourist Astrid met. A smile in her freckled face, bright, loud clothes. Among this family, it's like her person body is flame glow, flicker, flaring. Maybe the thought of parents flame light sparked performance. With Darling's silence about her own father's, Astrid's very grateful for her parents' food meat and kindness until well into the meal, she hears their vowels rounding, their consonants clipping, their words switching to match equal mate Darling's own and becomes unspeakably rage froth seething. And when her own in is one, she goes quiet, want needing someone to notice, her mother to smile and say friend, child, love, and with it bring her back to the old family table. But the heart of Astrid's silence has awful gravity, and so the conversation, drift, fail, flags, falls, hears itself, grows less and less real, till it's only darling who's still smiling and speaking. Mm. That's phenomenal. That's so good. I mean, it works in so many different ways. You know, you've got the narrative, you've got the poetic narrative, you've got all these different things. How did you... And I can actually see my son's gone to bed. How how did you see? Um, how did you go about mapping all this out? Okay, I think that was a question that I had throughout reading. It. Yeah, how, how, um, how a lot of post its yeah. <laughs> I mapped it out with a lot of post its for character and theme. And I um, when I first started writing it, I was focused on like world building and trying to create this place and I would say the first year or two I was I was really just sketching out the world and the universe and I only had the thinnest idea of plot and then about sort of a third of the way into it I was like okay I have to actually work out what the plot is and I, I wrote all of the existing poems and I, I, I put each one on a post-it and had some notes about characters and themes and then made a massive like two-dimensional chart and then started putting post-its in to work out how to fill out a meaningful story. And then I had a full manuscript, but really the plot element of it didn't come together until near the end when I, um, I worked with its first editor, uh, James Harding, who does some writing for sitcom and soap opera. And um, James like fixed the plot because it was a mess. It was like, it had all these threads that didn't work. And James would say things like, you need to move your meat cute earlier in the book. Your meat cute happens a third of the way in. It's got to happen earlier. And he would tell me things like this. And I was like, okay, I'll try it. And then I would do it and it would work. Um, yeah. And in the end, I was like, you know what? I'm going to use some really conventional plotting mechanics um, because so much about this book is unconventional that I think it needed quite a straightforward plot a straightforward kind of three act structure, which is sitting there to sit on in terms of how the romance develops in terms of how some of the like sci-fi mystery drama develops. And I would work with James to ensure that like each character in the book had their own arc with its own challenges and resolutions. And like, I'm a poet that has done a tiny bit of fiction writing and learning how to do all of that stuff as a poet was a joy. Mm. Um, and figuring out how to make the, the poetic line kind of work in service of the plot. But I ended up thinking about like these plot, like the 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 soapy plot structure, is like is a poetic form. You can treat it as a poetic form, like a sonnet. Like it has a set of rules, and you can work within those rules, and you can disobey those rules. And it it, it it's a it's a structure that you can work within, like any other structure, which is just what poetry is as well. Mm. And and I think that when I was reading it, I was going to ask you about with the Orkney it looks to be in kind of you think it's in a predetermined form but it's it's not it's all kind of sometimes they're in 12 sometimes they're in eight you know like they're all 
what was the thinking behind having the Orkney in, in that making it look like it was in form, but the English just all looked the same at the bottom there. It was kind of uniformed. Sure. Um, so in, yeah, in terms of the form, like each, each all of the poems are in a are in a regular meter, but each of them is in a regular meter of their own, and and that's partly just because I tend to be a metered writer. Um, but it's also um, using meter was it was it. I don't know how well this works, but it was an attempt to guide non-Orkney readers into the rhythms of the speech that, like, if they can lean on rhythms that they know, it might help them through the rhythms of the speech. So it was partly that, and it was partly using different metres to get at the voices or consciousnesses of different characters. So Ivan, who is a very slow and quiet character, has a very tends to work with very short lines and very short stanzas because it slows down the reading. And then characters who are a bit like wilder and busier will have a longer line and dactylic meter and so on. So that's kind of why the Orkney and meter. And then the English is in prose, which is a, it's a technique that I borrowed from the Shetland writer, um, Robert Allen Jameson, who in his book, uh, North Atlantic Drift, did the same thing. So I borrowed that technique from him. And it's partly a way to minoritize the English. And it's also partly a way to um, indicate that the English is a literal translation rather than a poetic translation, I would say. And it's to it's to not grant the English kind of the privilege of poetry, mm. essentially. Um, so that's kind of what's going on there. Also, it's very difficult to translate into meter. So yeah. I was giving myself a bit of a relief. Yeah, no, it, it felt, it definitely felt that it was almost like a footnote which i really liked because there was like a hierarchy on the page and like the kind of a precedence and this is the important like start here and end up here which i really i really enjoyed that element of it as well um and the space and and the science fiction element this is what i'm saying like with each everywhere you look there's another complication added to it which it just makes it so brilliant um i read your thread uh, patricia sent me your thread um uh. earlier today on science fiction writing i wonder if you could you know we've only we've got five minutes left but just brief it was such a brilliant thread just talk about what you kind of put put there oh yikes um um uh, or maybe maybe uh, uh, uh pbs can do us a favor and, and retweet one of those threads after this yeah, so yeah. people can find it and i don't have to because i need to log off social media after this i tell you um What's going on with science fiction? I There's lots of things I could say about that, about like the history of Scottish science fiction and how that has related to like Scottish nationalism and, and blah, 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 blah. There's all sorts of threads. But I think the thing that I'm most interested about and that for me is in this book is about um, how nostalgia and utopia are kind of two sides of the same coin. And if the historical, if the Scottish historical novel is like this nostalgic vision of Scotland, like the Walter Scott stuff. And that's one kind of thing that like weighs on Scotland. Then the utopian hope that you find in say the Ian Banks culture novels, this like, this, this sort of utopian liberalism and the critique of utopian liberalism is the other thing that's weighing down the other end. And that, that kind of like seesawing between utopia and nostalgia is also a thing that I find a lot of people feel about the islands and about rurality. Orkney kind of features as, you know, happiest place in the UK to live or whatever, which is in many ways like a total nonsense. Um, and, and people will move to Orkney kind of chasing like rural idyll. And then people in Orkney are also trying to like hold on to forms of the past and forms of the future um, and keep islands going. And so like nostalgia and utopia kind of pull how you feel about the islands forward. So science fiction was a way of exploring that. And for me, I wanted to have my own kind of utopian desires about my home, which like in, in the, the clearest way, like I've created a sort of queer utopia on my imagined space station where like there is a free, freer vision of gender and sexuality. And then I've tried to like critique my own hope for utopia at the same time. So that's, that's kind of why science fiction amongst a whole bunch of other things. Yeah. Amazing. That is, that is fantastic. Yeah. I think, um, the PBS said that they're going to retweet that link. So, yeah, it's fascinating <laughs> what Josie was putting out there. Um, really, really great stuff. Thank you both to um, Vani, Ezekiel, Anthony, and to Harry, Josephine, Giles. Their books are absolutely phenomenal. I've got them both up here, and I recommend everyone 
goes and does a, a reading. I can't really do this. I'm holding the phone at the same time. Uh, go, go, goes and reads them as and when they can. Thank you both for joining us tonight. Um, it's been a, it's been a pleasure. Um, and I'm going to upload this onto the PBS Instagram mm -hmm. site, so it should be there for those who didn't catch it. They can watch it back with some popcorn um, and and have a great great time. Uh, we'll log out. Um, thank you, PBS. Thank you, Barney, and thank you, Josie. Have a, a great night and see you further down the road. Good night. Good night. Bye-bye.